Well, I yoga stupid all the time anyway. <laughs> but um, yeah, the notes that you have here that are copied for you are good notes, and I want you to keep those. But the notes that I'm going to use tonight, I have here, and I'll put them on the board. Uh, if you missed last week, it was a dandy one. Um, I left the notes on the board. I usually don't do that unless there's a reason. And there's a reason. The calendar that we go by, the Gregorian calendar, and I have the notes last week. If, um, if any of you want a, a copy of it, let us know. This calendar that we go by that was established by Pope Gregory the First in the 1500s is the calendar that we go by today. Why is this relevant for Resurrection Sunday? Because the timing is all off. Period. It was in conjunction with the Catholic Church and is based on astronomy and astrology. And history has proved that. And <coughs> the dispensation time period, which is a thousand years each, is very important because the last dispensation time period that has yet to be fulfilled is the thousand year reign of Christ. Which means, and I have my data in my Bible to prove it, We've been through 4,000 years. The Earth has not been around for billions and billions of years. Science has proven that. Charles Darwin was the one of the first ones, and Sir Isaac Newton stumbled upon evidence that the world is not billions of years old. It's actually thousands, and that's in conjunction with the Bible. Genesis, 4,000 AD BC was when the world started. That's when history was recorded. And the Old Testament has spanned the time of 4,000 years, which is four dispensations. We are living in the year 2014, which means two more dispensations has been fulfilled, which brings us to 6,000 years. Why is that relevant? Well, for all the time history that the Catholic Church, they have taken away time and added time and taken away time. See, the Jewish calendar only has 10 months of the year. Tens a cycle. This is based on 12. So they have taken away time and modified it for the purpose of being close to the spring equinox, which is otherwise known as Easter, which is Ishtar, a pagan holiday. Why is that relevant? Because all the calendar is based on is based on the traditions and the sacraments of a religion and not on, on the truth of God's word and time. What are we meaning? We are living in the month of Nisan, March and April. Why is that relevant? Because Jesus born, was born and died on the same month, Nisan. Why is that relevant? Nisan is the, the season of sacrifices, the Feast of Sacrifices, where the Passover is also commemorated. It celebrated Israel's freedom from tyranny and bondage. So our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ died on the same month, that's where the sacrifices took place. The free is the ultimate sacrifice. The world was created in six days. Seventh day, rest. This, the seven, day, uh, the seven days that are recorded in Genesis chapter 1, corresponds with a dispensation period of seven. God gave us a preview of the timeline here. We have, this is a rough estimate. 6,982. It doesn't take a genius to know that it us 18 years between the end of this dispensation and the beginning of the seventh one. That should cause us to be ready. I have here the notes in the calendar. I'm going to read this to you. This is amazing. The days of the week were established by the Emperor Constantine in 321 AD in the seven-week Roman calendar. All the Roman calendar is based on astrology and astronomy. Here's your proof. And if you want it, like I said, I have copies. I can give it for you. All this could be validated. Monday is the day of the moon. Tuesday is the day of Venus. Wednesday is the day of Mercury. Thursday is the day of Jupiter. Friday is the day of Venus again. Saturday is the day of Saturn. Sunday is the day of the sun, but it's S-U-N. They actually worship the sun on Sunday. 
Mm. That's also in the Bible. The months of the year. Janus, reflective of January, the Roman god of gates, doorways, beginnings. February. Ferus is Shrukan, the god of death. Actually, the word February means fever. Wow. March was named after Mars, the god of war. April is an extension of March. May, Maya Maestis, the Roman goddess of springtime, war, and increase. Yes, that's also in conjunction with Ishtar. June, Juno, Juno, which is the Roman goddess and the wife of Jupiter. Okay. July, named after Julius Caesar, who was worshipped as a god. August, named after the first Roman emperor, Caesar Augustus. September, Latin word for seven. October, the Latin word for eight. November, the Latin word for nine. And December, the Latin word for ten. It's interesting. All this is reflective of the Roman calendar. When did Jesus arose? I wish I had a yoga coupon, but Morgan took the last one. The answer is found on Matthew 28. Let's go to Matthew 28. We're going to go over this. Matthew 28. Here's what the Word of God says. very first verse says, It was at the end of the Sabbath, and as began in the dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. You know it's interesting that the first two people to go see the tomb were his mother and a harlot? Ex-harlot. Ex-harlot. <laughs> harlot before. Now I can understand Mary even though she was not officially mother because as uh, history and genetics and science has proven that I mean God, God is God his blood everything is of God but why would Mary Magdalene go? I think to me that she was the most of the faithful of the disciples. She never decide what she helped her. Exactly and she was the most faithful to all the uh, she was more faithful than the disciples because if you read here in verses 1 and 2 it's pretty apparent that none of the disciples were there. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Which speaks to the faith and testament of the resurrection that people that are truly looking for Jesus are the people in need. Mary Magdalene had seven demons in her. She was a harlot. She was the dregs of society. She was a much of a person in society. Society looked down on her because of who she was and what she did, but in the eyes of Jesus, not only did Jesus save her life, but Jesus gave her a new life. And see, that's the meaning of the resurrection that I want to talk to you about this evening. The resurrection should mean the same thing to every believer out there. The resurrection means three things. It means victory. Number one, victory over death, hell, and the grave. Victory over sin. Victory over the devil. We are not a defeated people. We are a born-again, spirit-filled, God-led people. The second thing that the resurrection represents to us is change. When Jesus died on the cross for our sins, not only did he pay for every one of our sins, but at the, un at the other end of the resurrection was the result of it, which meant change. For you see, Mary Magdalene here in verse 1 in chapter 28 represented the epitome of change. Her life was changed by the forgiveness, love, and mercy of Jesus Christ. And I like what Lynn said here, she was an ex-harlot. She was not a harlot anymore. Society may bring up her past as a harlot, and people may talk behind her back and say, You see that hoe over there following Jesus? That, that, that's a hoe. Now, what is Jesus doing here getting the hoes over here? And they would bring up her past and bring up what she did. 
But I bet you when she was near the disciples, they never brought up her past. I bet you Jesus never once brought up her past. Amen? I don't think Jesus ever said, tell me about your past life. I don't think Jesus cared about her past life. All he cared about was her future. See, Mary Magdalene represents the epitome of change. In the eyes of God, she's white as snow. She's pure. Her checkered past is gone. And the reason it's gone because of that day on the cross, when she died on the cross, it made change for us. See, your old self should be dead. Your old self should be dead at the cross with Jesus. All your sins were slain and paid for at the cross, so everything that has been done and said should be laid at the cross of Jesus Christ. That old self is dead. That old person is gone, and changes happen. Mary Magdalene is an example of that. You think she was still a harlot when she went to that tomb on that day? No. She stopped being a harlot when? The day that Jesus met her face to face and forgave her and cleansed her and gave her a new life. The resurrection represents victory and change. The resurrection also represents the most important thing of all, eternal life. If I were to ask you about your life, what would be some of the first things that you would name that make up your life? Remember last week I said, if you had seven days to live, what would you do in those seven days? If you knew you had seven days to live on this earth, what would you do? Let's look at what Jesus did. From last week at the triumphal entry in Jerusalem, Jesus went into Jerusalem. They worshipped Him as Messiah and they praised Him as Hosanna. Hosanna means to save. A week later, He was hanging on the cross. In those seven days, Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. He prayed that this cup that the Father gave Him the drink would be passed. And the Father says, no, you have to drink of this cup. Jesus shared the Last Supper with His disciples, preparing them for the future, preparing them that they must go on, even after He is gone. In those seven days, Jesus was beaten and whipped, and I mean, He was just slaughtered. And folks, I'm not telling you right now, I don't know if any movie, if, I don't know if Hollywood could bring to life what really happened at that day, to witness the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It's an awesome event. But in each of those seven days, Jesus never thought about himself. He never thought about me. He thought about we. He wasn't thinking of us at the cross. He was, he, I mean, he wasn't thinking of himself. He was thinking of us. He wasn't thinking of the pain he went through. If you remember the prayer that he said on the cross, one of the prayers he said was, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He forgave his enemies. He paid for forgiveness for his enemies. Even at the very in witness, he witnessed at the very end when he turned to the cross, uh, turned to the thief, that asked him to remember him on that day. He says, "You know, we receive our just deserts. We are criminals. We deserve what we get." Here was an innocent man, and Jesus turned to him and says, "Today, you will be with me in paradise." That's what Jesus did for seven days. Of, his, of the last seven days of his life. Jesus did all this so he could save us. He did all this so he could give us a new life. What does the resurrection mean to you? That's the question I'm going to ask you to see me. What does the resurrection mean to you personally? I don't, I, I don't care about your opinions or your views. Does it touch your heart? Does it mean something to your soul? When you hear and when you sing the songs of Jesus, does it mean something to you? When you see the cross of Jesus, like behind me, is that just a wooden cross, just a symbol, or does it mean something more to you? When you hear the name of Jesus and speak the name of Jesus, is it just another name like Bob or Daniel or Kay, or does that name mean something to you? Is that name mean power and savior and king? What about today? Is today like any ordinary day? 
where you just get up, brush your teeth, use the restroom, go eat, whatever you do in the day. Is it just another day to you? Or does this day mean something to you? Is this day special among any other days of this year? <clears throat> For you see, this was the day that victory was won over our death, hell, and the grave. This was the day that Jesus sealed your salvation. This was the day most of all. And this to me was the greatest way that Billy Graham said the cross represented. I saw a Billy Graham special a few, a few nights ago. I'm going to tell you, when this man goes home, it'll be a sad day. <clears throat> he's the last of the good ones. <clears throat> he's, <clears throat> he's the last of the, of the truth tellers. He's not Hollywood. He's not all about the mega church and money. He's not all about <clears throat> popularity. No. He said the cross meant love. <clears throat> what? Let's repeat that again. He said the cross is the ultimate symbol of love. <clears throat> what is the ultimate symbol of love to you? Is it a ring? No. Mercedes? I had a neighbor who says, his wife said, the greatest gift my husband ever gave me was a Mercedes. Did you know Mercedes break? Did you know that if something's wrong with a part of that Mercedes, that's more money you got to pay? What happens if you if you wreck that car? Is it you have to get another car? Mm. What is the greatest symbol of love to you? A child? I have news for you. That is not your child. Hello. Love not worldly. The Bible says that every good gift comes from above. Where do you think our children come from above? Job chapter 1, he told Job, Job, you have beautiful children, but they're going home to me. I'm taking them. You can't go to court and say, uh, I want an injunction. Don't do that. God could do whatever he wants. He is God. But here's the thing about God on the opposite side of the coin. He sent his only begotten son to die on the cross for our sins. Have you ever stopped to think about that? He sent his son. His son did not deserve anything on the cross. He did not deserve any beating. He did not deserve any mockery. He did not deserve any of that. But God sent his son to die. Would you send your son to die? Of course not. That's my son. But God didn't give it a second thought when he sent his son. Amen. God didn't give it a second thought when he was born in that manger. God knew, God the Father knew that God the Son had to die one day for our sins. He knew exactly the mission of his son. When Jesus was growing in the household of Mary and Joseph, he knew that one day he would have to lay down his life for us. He would have to lay down his life for his mother, for his brother, his siblings. If he had to die for the world, and he knew it. That was the mission. That's what Resurrection Day means to me. He means love. He loved us. While we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5.8. And I thought about that verse. That says, Lord, I'm the one that deserves to die. Okay. I'm the one that deserves to be punished. I'm the one that deserves to be nailed to the cross. Yeah. It was my sin you died for. You did not have to die for my sins. And he says, yes, I do, because I love you. Matthew chapter 28 says this. Verse 2, And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven. He came and rolled back the stone from the door, and he sat upon it. His countenance was like what lightning is, his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him that the keepers did shake and became as dead men. You want to talk about scared to death? That's your term right there. <laughs> the angel answered and said to the woman, Fear not, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified. Look at verse 6. He is not here. He is not here. He is not here. He is risen and has said, Come and see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and behold, he goes before you in Galilee. And there shall you see him, Lord, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulchre with fear and with great joy. Imagine that with fear and great joy in the same body. And did run to bring them, his disciples the word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them and saying, All hell. And they came and held them and worshipped him by his feet. Verse 10, Jesus said, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they should go to Galilee. And they shall see me. 
See, here's the thing about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Do you believe it? Can you sit here today and say, I believe every word this book says. I believe that Jesus is alive. I don't have to, like, like Thomas. Man, Thomas got on my nerves, forgive me. He just gets on my nerves. Wake up, man! Believe it! Believe it, Kudro! He's there! Jesus is there. I'm going to tell you something. I, I, when, G, when I see Jesus, you don't have to convince me with uh, DNA and everything. I believe it. My faith tells me that's Him. Do you believe that Jesus is alive? And if you do, do you live like He's alive? If you believe He's sitting at the right hand of God, do you live like He's sitting at the right hand of God? Or do you live like He's a dead person that doesn't see and hear what we say and do? See, Christians today, I think, in the latter part, they live their life as though Jesus is dead. Because they think they can get away with anything they can under the sun because Jesus is dead. Oh, he, he's, he's not alive. That's what the atheists say. That's what the unbelievers say. That's what communists say. That's what agnostics say. You know what? I don't think He's alive. I don't think there's a judgment day, and I really don't think there's a heaven. I believe what I want to believe. I make my own heaven. I make my own peace. I make my own way. You know who's speaking that? The devil. The devil wants you not to believe there's a resurrection. The devil says, you know what? Jesus is dead. That's why the world has wars, and that's why we have tribulation. That's why we have cancers, and that's why your loved ones go home, because he's dead. And the devil will point the finger at you and he will say, He is dead. Live your life. You got a life. Live it. This Jesus is gone. And the devil would say. But the truth of the matter is this. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God, very much alive. And he is seeing and hearing everything that we do as Christians and as believers. Are we working for Jesus as though he's alive? Or are we living for ourselves? Or are we looking forward to a soon coming return? Or are we looking for the next blockbuster movie? Or are we living our life as though Jesus is going to take us home? Or are we getting ready for our next appointment with destiny? Which is it? Or are we ready for Jesus? Jesus was ready to take the cross. Jesus was ready to take the nails. Jesus was ready to take everything for us. Or are we ready for Him? See, that's what people forget. He's risen. What does that mean? He's coming back. He's coming back. He's coming back very soon. How soon? Look at the timetable. This is from a simple old Mexican in the woods. I can figure this out. Folks, that's 18 years between the 6th and 7th dispensation. The blood moons and cycle ends in the year 2017. When the cycle of the blue moons are, a blood moon is done, Jesus is ready. He could come at any time. He could come in 2017. He could come right now. And I don't know about you, but like the greatest example was Billy Sunday. If you have not read the works of Billy Sunday, I advise you to read them. He's one of my favorite preachers. The man was awesome. He was a former drunk. A drunk. Couldn't get enough uh, couldn't get enough liquor and if God saved his soul, cleared his mind, cleared everything, and he became a powerful preacher for Jesus Christ. He once says, if there was a fire in your house, what would be the first thing you would get? What would be the first thing you'd get if there was a fire in this house? What do you think it would be? I could give you an answer real quick. The dogs. The cat. I would get out. You can replace pictures and things. You can't replace life. When Jesus died on the cross, He died to give us life. He died to save us. Let's look here. Matthew 20. I'm going to show you something in Matthew 28. Go to verse 18. I'm going to talk about something else too. What is power to you? Is 
power measured in strength and how much weight you can move and lift. It's power measured in how much and then what you can hold as a person. What is power? Authority and control. Amen. Jesus said in verse 18 that he came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Now what does that mean? Power that means is that what? What did you say? Power is control. all power. Okay. In verse 18. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. That means that Jesus has all power, all authority, all control. That's an absolute term. In theological terms, that means that all power, there is no power outside of Jesus Christ. He has all power in heaven and in earth. He said in verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Baptism is important. It is not to be treated lightly. Why? Because it is part of the great commission that Jesus gives to the church. After he resurrected and before he went home and ascended to his home in heaven, he gave strict instructions to the church. And he said in verse 19, Teach all nations what He has taught them. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. If you are not baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, you are not baptized according to Jesus. If you've been sprinkled, you have not been baptized. Wait a minute, Pastor. I disagree with you. It doesn't matter how you're baptized. It really doesn't matter. If it doesn't matter, then why wasn't Jesus sprinkled? Hello? Mm -hmm. If it doesn't matter, how come Jesus was not baptized as a baby? Hello? Does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. No. I mean, if Jesus is going to go against tradition and rudiments and everything else, he would have done it. But he stuck to his Father's will. That's where it came from. And see, a lot of people don't understand about Jesus because they think that Jesus came and left a set of rules and that we could change him and adjust them. But Jesus never told the church to change anything of the Bible. He never told the church to change baptism. He never told the church to change the Word. He never told the church to change salvation. He never gave the church authority because He did not give the church any power to do that to begin with, right? When He says all power is given to me in heaven and earth, Jesus says this is the way it is. This is it. This is how it is. This is how you must be baptized. This is how you must teach. And this is the truth that you must teach. And you think about that for a minute and it just dawns on you how God, through His Son, makes it very apparent that we as people, that we as people must understand and know this, that whatever Jesus has laid at our step, whatever responsibility Jesus has given us, we have to follow it through. Because if we don't follow it through, we have to answer to Jesus. Exactly. And see, we don't answer to the Pope. We don't answer to a committee or a convention or a board. We answer to Him. He's the head of the church. Mm -hmm. And if you remember in that scene, there were only 12 people. <coughs> Bless you, in that church. I've heard and been told to me personally that people don't believe this is a church. Because we don't have the stained glass windows in the building. We don't have ministries. And we're too small. People don't take us serious because we're too small. People don't take us serious because we meet in a home. People have even called us a cult because we meet in a home. People don't take us serious as a church because we, we don't have a board. We're not led by a committee. We're not under a convention. People don't take us serious because we're not big. People don't take us serious because we don't have money. They look at us and say we're just an old Bible study group in the woods that get together, sing a few songs, preach the word, and then they leave. They don't take us seriously. But I've had news for you. There is one who takes us very seriously. There is one who takes us seriously every day, every second, and every hour. There is one who takes us so seriously that he is here among us right now. And he is sitting with his angels. And he is sitting waiting to hear the truth that He has given to us. And I'm telling you right now, if you go and tell Him that we're not a church, if you go and tell Him that we're nothing, He will have a few words to say to you, back to you, and tell you, you are dead wrong. 
That is my church. Those are my people. That is His cross. Amen. That's His blood. That that is His Bible, and these are His people. Amen. On the other side of the coin, you got churches that have more people. But I will tell you this: if I was a gambling man on on, on that day of the rapture, those churches will still be full of people. Why? Did they really believe in Jesus to begin with? Yeah. Or did they believe in the pastor? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did they believe in Jesus to begin with? Or did they believe in the traditions and the ceremonies of the church? Mm -hmm. Did they believe in Jesus to begin with? Or did they believe in some artifact or some prayer or some card that they signed? Did they really believe in Jesus to begin with? Or did they believe in themselves to get saved? Power. Here's real power. Luke 5, 24. What makes Jesus Jesus? He has the power to forgive. How many of you are uptight and get mad over anything? Raise your hand. If someone give you a dirty look? What you looking at? <laughs> If somebody took your parking space at Walmart and you've been driving for 10 minutes looking for a parking space and they took your parking space, dude, would you cuss? <laughs> what if somebody stole your boyfriend or girlfriend? You really have one. What if you get mad because someone got a better gift than you? Jesus was on the cross dying for our sins and he still prayed for forgiveness. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Look at 5, uh, 24. Look 5, 24. Jesus said this, But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power, hath authority upon earth to forgive sins. He said unto the sick and the palsy, I say unto you, Arise and take up thy couch and go to thine house. A lot of people think that Jesus forgave them, uh, uh, like Jesus healed the man first. No, he didn't. Look at verse 23 in Luke 5. Luke 5, 23 says, Which is easy to say, thy sins be forgiven thee, or rise up and walk? The first thing that Jesus did, he rose, he forgave his sins, and then he healed them. <clears throat> the Son of Man hath a power and authority upon earth to forgive sins. What does that mean? That means simply this. Only Jesus has the power to forgive your sins. He has the power and the authority not only to forgive your sins. It's not enough to say I'm sorry, but He takes away the guilt of your sin. He takes away the past of your sin. He takes away the memories of your sin. He takes away everything that is associated with sin in your life, and He takes that away from you. There may be some here this evening, and some that are watching, that still have the residue of sin in their lives. Some sort of memory, some sort of consequence that hangs around them like a ball and chain. And you can't get rid of it. It leads to depression. It leads you to get drunk. It leads you to do something stupid because of sin. I have news for you. This evening, Jesus will take that sin away from you Amen. forever. And you will never have to drink to forget about it. You will never have to get high to forget about it. You will never have to do anything to forget about it again if you leave it at the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. He has the power to forgive your sin. But I did this, this, this. Listen, you can name by the baddest of the bad. Jesus will forgive your sin. He forgave Mary Magdalene. And she was one of the first ones on the scene in the tomb to see it empty. Jesus forgave David and he committed adultery and cold-blooded murder to get that Sheba. He forgave Moses who killed a man with his bare hands. And under, under Egyptian law, he should have been killed. Look at, look at who Jesus calls to service. Murderers, liars, deceivers. A lot of people think that that Jesus, that, that Jesus only calls good and perfect people. There's no good and perfect people. See, a lot of people think that He calls the qualified, but He actually qualifies the call. He is the one that chooses and uses us as instruments to do His bidding. So if you sit here thinking that Jesus can't use me, He can use you. If you sit here thinking, I'm not smart enough to serve Jesus, let me tell you something. You don't need brains. You need wisdom to serve Jesus. I'm not strong enough to serve Jesus. Jesus will give you the strength to serve Him. I'm not rich enough to serve Jesus. You don't have to be rich to serve Jesus. 
I have to be perfect to serve Jesus. God means for you, you'll never be perfect, but Jesus will still use you. 